Okay, so one of the last things we talked about in the last video was some of the conclusions that we made about Vesper theory. Yes, it's very reliable, and it gets us about 90% of the way uh, you know, to the answer of a structure of a molecule. So that's, that's awesome. And, you know, if we were looking at nursing chemistry or intro chemistry, you know, that that does the work for us. We're, but there is that 10 percent that we still kind of need to focus on. Yes, Vesper theory is great, but there's one pervading question that still needs to be answered. And that question is this. How does or does electron pair repulsion really determine the shape of a molecule? That it's more complicated. Yes, but. So now we're going to talk about the buts. We're going to talk about the 10% of the molecules that don't quite get an answer from Vesper theory. All right, so let's talk about this a little bit more. So Vesper theory provides a pretty straightforward, simple method for predicting the geometry of molecules. All you have to do is know how many lone pairs, how many bonding pairs, and then you figure it out, you know, based on that. Okay. But G. and Lewis's theory of chemical bonding doesn't clearly explain why chemical bonds exist. So remember that he talked about you have two atoms that share electrons, but his theory, his bonding theory, can't explain why some bonds are longer and some bonds are shorter. Okay. Now, on top of this, so keep in mind, G. and Lewis, this work that he did, this was about 1918. Okay, so G. N. Lewis was about the end of the, the First World War, 1925-26. You get Erwin Schrödinger coming up with the Schrödinger wave equation. <clears throat> 1927, you've got the Born-Oppenheim approximation, and people starting to work on on figuring out how to use the Schrödinger wave equation and apply it to other molecules and other bonds. Okay, so that gets us to where we're at in the story. So there's also another major problem. And here, and here it is. Another problem was the element carbon. And if you guys remember, the, car, the electronic configuration of carbon, and I'm going to write it out in orbital, orbital notation, carbon has six valence electrons, or six electrons. So the electronic configuration would be 1s2, 2s2, and then it's going to have two electrons in 2p, and they're going to be unpaired. Okay? So the electronic configuration is going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. So the way we interpret this in terms of bonding is that since you have these two unpaired electrons in the 2p area, that means carbon would be able to form two bonds because you have two unpaired electrons. Pretty straightforward. Okay. Now... We also, here's the problem though, carbon has four valence electrons. All right, that still is okay because you have two electrons in the 2s, so that's, get, that, that's how you get your four. Not a problem either. All right, but here's where it gets a little dicey. Vesper theory says this. If you guys remember, methane, CH4, carbon has four bonds. Okay, so the electronic configuration says Carbon's going to form two bonds, okay? But Vesper theory says carbon needs to form four bonds. And that's a problem, okay? And just so we get, uh, get this straight, let me write the electronic configuration part. Electron configuration says... Two electrons are unpaired. It should form two bonds. Now, again, we know carbon's going to form four bonds. Methane is a real compound, okay? And that's been verified. It's got four bonds. All four bonds are the same size, same shape, uh, same heats of, of formation, all that good stuff. <clears throat> so there's a, there's a problem here. Either the Vesper theory is wrong, okay, so carbon's not going to form four bonds, or carbon's going to use a new set of atomic orbitals not like the ones that we know so far. 
And it turns out, it turns out it's actually both. A, the Vesper theory doesn't quite connect the electronic configuration of atoms to bonds. And that's the problem that we're seeing here. So, so that's that's the problem. That's that's the main issue that we're talking about today. How do we make Vesper theory connect to electronic configuration? How do we make sense of all this stuff? Okay. So, based on all these issues, it was it was clear that Vesper theory doesn't quite answer all the questions. So, we currently have two bonding theories on covalent bonding. So the first one is going to be the focus of what we're going to talk about here, which is called Vesper theory, uh, valence bond theory. The other one is going to be called molecular orbital theory, and that's going to be the subject of the next video. So in valence bond theory, and I apologize, there's going to be quite a bit of writing. Valence bond theory assumes that the electrons in the molecule occupy atomic orbitals of the individual atoms. In a molecule occupy atomic orbitals of the individual atoms. And this allows this allows us to think of atoms taking part in bond formation. Now that isn't a very, and I'll, I'll be honest, this isn't a completely clear definition of valence bond theory, but this is going to make a whole lot of sense once we start working with individual molecules and see how this works. Okay, so that's valence bond theory. The other theory that we're going to talk about is called molecular orbital theory. And for molecular orbital theory, this assumes the formations of molecular orbitals from atomic orbitals. Okay, so this, these two theories pretty much get us to the front line of how we understand bonding today. There's, there's quite a few nuances to, the, to this, and there's other theories that come up, but this is going to get us pretty close to modern, to what we're thinking today. So, so Vesper theory does a good job on its own. Valence bond theory does an awesome job on its own, and that's actually what's going to carry us for, for a whole year of organic chemistry. Molecular orbital theory, same deal. It's also going to carry us for a whole year more of, of uh, organic chemistry. But not one of these on its own is going to give us a single answer for all compounds. But if we use all three of these theories in tandem sometimes, or you know we use Vesper with, with Valen's bond or Vesper with molecular orbital, sometimes we have to work in tandem. It's going to get us pretty close to what we need. Okay. So sometimes you're not going to get a straight answer from all of them, but as you, if you use them all together, you'll get there. So all I'm going to do for Gen Chem, for for what you for for what you need in Gen Chem right now, is I'm going to give you a pretty good overview of valence bond theory, and I'm going to give you a pretty good overview of molecular orbital theory. What will what you'll then do as you go forward and study more more chemistry is that you're going to get more of the story with valence bond theory and you get more of the story with molecular orbital theory. So if you guys go on to organic one, that's where you're going to get a review of what we're talking about here, but then you're going to get a little bit more of the story. And if you go on to PCHEM, which would be awesome if you guys do, but if you go on to PCHEM, you'll get a whole lot more of the story. So, so this is just to whet your appetites and get you pretty, you know, give you a pretty good overview of what's going on. But the more chemistry you take, the more background, the more information you're going to get about these. Okay, so the first attempt that we're going to look at uh, uh, valence bond theory 
we're going to take a look at it from a series of molecules. So the first molecule that we want to look at is methane. And again, methane has that molecular formula CH4. Okay. So ideally, bonding for methane will occur using the 1s orbital from hydrogen and either the 2s or 2p orbitals from carbon. So if we want to form a carbon hyd one carbon hydrogen bond, all right? So we want to form just one carbon hydrogen bond. What we would do is take the 1s orbital from hydrogen and overlap it with either the 2s or 2p orbital from carbon. Okay. So there are a few problems with this. And so here's the first one. 2s and 2p, if you guys remember a couple of videos back, they have different sizes. They have different radii. So using 2s and 2p orbitals will lead to two types of carbon-hydrogen bonds. Okay. So you could, one type would be you have the 1s from hydrogen overlapping with a 2s from carbon. You could also have the 1s from hydrogen overlapping with a 2p from carbon. So what that means is that you're going to have two different types of bonds. But, and I can't stress this enough, but methane has four identical bonds. Okay, so automatically we know that can't happen. It's not going to be the 2s and the 2ps, you know, mixing with a, with a 1s. That's not going to happen because that's going to give you two different types of bonds. They all got to be the same. And so here's the other thing that we got to keep in mind. And this is specifically for the two P's now. The two P orbitals, and keep in mind that there's three of these, they're all perpendicular. To each other. <clears throat> And so we're talking about 90 degree angles. Okay. But Vesper theory says that the angles have to be 109.5 degrees. Okay. So that's another major thing. Here, the angles, you know, if we just use two P's on its own, the angles will be at 90 degrees. All right, cool. But Vesper th says, well, the angles need to be 109.5. So what the hell is going on? Something's not right. Okay. So here's the, and then to conclude here, if we assume that methane, CH4, has the same four bonds. We have to assume that they have the same atomic orbitals. There's no other way around this. Okay, so that's that's the issues that we're dealing with. Okay, so all that being said, let's talk about solutions now. I, I complained so much about, about this. Let's talk about how this works. So what we're going to do to solve the problem is we're going to mix the 2S and the 2P orbitals, and this process of mixing is called hybridization. Okay, so here's what we do. I'm going to write this out and then I'm going to explain this more. So the first step is that we promote an electron from 2s to 2p.
Okay, so we get four unpaired electrons. Okay, and then once we get that, step two, we then mix or blend up the orbitals. And by doing this, we get four orbitals with the same energy and size. And so this new orbital is going to be called the sp3 hybridized orbital. All right, so let me read that again. Here, what we're going to do is promote an electron from 2s to 2p, so we get two, we get four unpaired electrons, and then we mix up or blend the atomic orbitals, and by doing this, we get these four new orbitals with the same energy and size. All right, so let me show you how this all works. All right, so let me start a new note. So carbon's electronic configuration is this, and I'm going to, I'm going to write it, orbital diagram, with the in energy increasing. So we got 1s, you got 2s, and then over here you got 2p. And we know this. Carbon's going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Okay, so we know that. Now the problem is, if we leave this alone as is, carbon's going to form two bonds because you've got two unpaired electrons. Well, to solve that problem, what we're going to do is promote one of the 2s electrons, and we're going to move it into 2p, okay? So I'm going to rewrite this again. So now the new electronic configuration would look like this. All right, so 1s2, you're going to have one electron in 2s, and now you're going to have three, you're going to have four unpaired electrons, one in 2s, and then three in 2p. So now that's how you form the four bonds. But you still got a problem because 2s is lower in energy than 2p. So what we're going to do, it's almost like we're going to take these orbitals, the 2s and the 3, 2p's, we put them in a blender, turn the blender on, and then we see what comes out. Okay. So by putting it in a blender and mixing it up, we get these brand new orbitals. So now the electronic configuration would be something like this. You're going to have 1s2. Oops, I'm running out of space on this page. Let me let me do this underneath. The new orbital would look like this. You got 1s, and then you got two electrons in here. But now you're going to have four brand new orbitals, which would be called the sp3 orbital. Okay, and now you would have four unpaired electrons in those new orbitals. Okay, now the way that we're getting sp3, the way that this reads, remember you had one s orbital that you used, and then you had three p orbitals. So that gets you a total of four, but that's how we're getting this, this sp3, that you got one part s, three parts p. And so that's, that's how we're getting this. Okay. Now, once we form these sp3 hybridized orbitals, they can overlap with the 1s orbital from hydrogen, and you're going to form four bonds with four different hydrogens. They're all the same size. They all have the same energy. Okay? So that's awesome. So now that's how we solve that problem. That's how we get around that. So let's, let's go back to the notes. So we call this the sp3 hybridized orbital. The sp3 orbitals can bond with the 1s orbital from hydrogen in order to get four of the same bonds. And again, I just I know I just said this, but I'm going to write this out that sp3, the way that we interpret this, you got one part s, 
So it has a 25% S character, and then you got three parts P, which is going to be about 75% P character. All right. Okay, so valence bond theory uses these things called hybrid orbitals, which are atomic orbitals obtained when two or more non-equivalent orbitals of the same atom combine in preparation for covalent bond formation. So they're using these sp3 hybridized orbitals. And hybridization refers to the mixing of atomic orbitals in an atom to generate a set of hybrid orbitals. So that's kind of how this whole process works. So next time, what we're going to take a look at is how does, how does a compound like ethylene bond 